the spirit within. You know, and that's how the Lord sees us, by the way. You know, when Adam and Eve, you remember when they ate the fruit in the garden and it said that they were naked, so they hid themselves? What's, and do you know why they were naked? It wasn't the fact they literally had no clothes on. They lost their light. The one part that made them connected to the Lord, the one part that made them connected to the Father, the one part that made them connected to the angel of the Lord, who is Jesus walking in the garden, they lost it. They had the light. They ate the fruit. They lied to the Lord. They tried to hide it. They lost it. They realized we don't have what we once had. But once Jesus came to the earth, he said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. We got our light back. So now in the spirit realm, you're glowing. Whether or not you feel like it on earth, whether or not you feel like it when you wake up, whether or not you feel like it when it's gloomy outside like it is today, you are a growing, glowing light of the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere you go. And the kingdom of darkness knows this. The kingdom knows it, and he hates it, and that's why he has done such a good job about making the Holy Spirit seem weird to people who are uneducated. And the sad part is, a lot of people, they think they're being spiritual, they don't realize they're being ignorant. They think they're being spiritual about things of the Holy Spirit, and how they passed away with the apostles, and how tongues is not for today, and how all this stuff isn't there anymore. They, they, they think they're being spiritual, they're ignorant. They don't know the promises, they don't know what the word says. And the enemy has done such a good job of hiding that because aside from salvation itself, being filled with the Spirit is the second biggest gift to a believer. The salvation makes you a new image. It recreates your spirit. You're reborn in the image of the Lord like you're supposed to be. But the Holy Spirit, that's where you get the power. That's where you get the revelation. That's where you get the authority to start walking in these things the Lord said we're going to walk in. I want to walk with these things. I want to walk in power, and I want to walk in authority. So I should probably know the third person of the Godhead who's going to bring that to pass. Because remember, the, the, the gospel said, or not the gospel, but the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he had said that there are many callings, but the same, or many gifts, but the same Spirit, many callings, but the same Lord, but it's the same Father who works all in all. The Holy Spirit gives the gifts, Jesus makes the calling, the Father designed this all before time began. It goes from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. That's how creation happened. Remember, John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And, or sorry, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was light, and the light was the life of man, and the darkness tried to overcome it, but He couldn't. So, what's that saying? Is that it was made through Him. The Father thought it all. He thought out creation, He thought out man, He said, let us make man in our image, and he went through the whole bloodline, the whole uh, eternity of mankind, and he came across our names. So the father thought it. He said, son, Jesus, this is what I want to happen. Jesus made it happen. Jesus brought it into creation. Oh, but the Holy Spirit was the God in Genesis 1-1 hovering above the waters to make it all a reality on this earth. They all work together. Just as much as they did in creation, they work together now for you and I. Amen? So we have the spirit within us. We have the Spirit of God on the inside of us everywhere we go. John 1, uh, actually, okay, yep, yeah, we're going to skip, and we're going to go back a little bit. I wanted to start on why we even have the Holy Spirit. Yes, he's the third person of the Godhead. But I wanted to go back, and I wanted to go over some stuff about why we have him in the first place. John 1, verses 10 through 13. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 12, but as many as received them, received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And I want to, I'm going to go to my next slide, but I'm going to jump right back. It was not just a name, it was a transfer of authority. So let's go back to John chapter, uh, John chapter 1. It says in verse 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. We replaced the previous sons of God. We replaced the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6. We replaced the sons of God in, the, uh, in Job 38 verse 8. And we replaced the sons of God in Jude who are in eternal chains of torment until the great day of judgment. So when 
that statement was made, it wasn't just saying, oh, you're now all children of God. He was stripping the last ones of their authority, and he gave it to his church. So now I'm a son of God, and I have what they used to have, but it gets even better for us. Amen? Amen. That's why they hate us so much. That's why the kingdom of darkness hates us so much. It's because they were stripped of what they had. And remember, they tried to war in heaven over this stuff. The leader, Lucifer, the devil, the Satan, he tried to war heaven. He said, I'm going to take my throne, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to exalt myself over uh, above the sons of God. They tried to war heaven. They tried to war Jesus. They tried to war God and fight to the death over this thing. Why do we have it? To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What they tried to destroy in eternity over, we get just because we call on the name of Jesus. It was handed to us because we're made in his image. They had to fight to have it. And now, not even that, but they lost it, and it was still given to us. So every time we say, in the name of Jesus over anything, that's what we're doing. Because I'm a son of God. Every area I'm at, I'm a son of God, and I have a glowing light on the inside of me pushing out the kingdom of darkness. It's in the word. It's my promise. It's my DNA forever because the Father is now my Father. You know, just like when Jesus was on the earth, you think of Jesus' Father. You don't think of Joseph. You think of God. You need to start thinking of your Father as God, not your natural Father. And that sets some people free, depending on the relationship they had. You don't think of Jesus' father as Joseph. You think of him as God. My father happens to be God now. My father cares for me. My father loves me. I was made in my father's image. I'm able to do things that God's able to do because I'm his offspring. I'm his DNA. Everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus prayed, everything that Jesus said, I can have the same results because I'm a son just like he was. And everywhere I go, when I speak the name of Jesus and I declare these things, I am going to see results. I am going to see the promises of God come to pass because I'm a son. Because the old sons of God lost it all and he gave it to us instead. And they've been trying to war over us ever since then. And they're doing a pretty good job right now. But, oh, there's going to be that day that angel blows that last trumpet. The archangel comes down and chains up the devil and throws him in the pit. He'll be released again for a little bit. But then the final say, so the final judgment, they're gone forever. We are with Jesus forever. We're with Jesus because Jesus, the second Adam, is going to come back and do it all over again. You ever notice that, how the devil's going to be chained up for a thousand years, but then he's going to be released for a season? You ever wonder why? I'll tell you why. Everything has to go full circle. When that happens, what's going to happen, remember, it says he sent out to deceive the nations. He sent out to deceive Eve. He sent out to deceive Adam to deceive the nations. But this time, the second Adam, Jesus, is going to do what the first Adam should have done, and that's throw him out forever. Adam was supposed to do it, and he messed it up. Jesus is going to do it forever. That's why the devil is going to be released again for a little bit, because they're going to have another showdown, the Garden of Eden 2.0, and the devil's going to lose this one and be cast into a lake of fire forever, and we're going to be with Jesus for all eternity. Praise the Lord. And that's my inheritance as a son of God. They lost it all. Praise the Lord. The angels, they were supposed to be teaching us. If you guys haven't watched it yet or you weren't here, um, maybe you haven't heard of this series yet. Pastor Joe did a series, uh, was it last summer, about a year and a half ago, called The Tragedy of the Sons of God. And what I'm touching on today, he spent a whole summer teaching on. So if you have some questions, you want some more answers, go listen to Pastor Joe's teaching Uh, tragedy of sons of God it is on our YouTube but they were supposed to be teaching us that's why when the devil showed up in the garden Adam and Eve were not surprised they were interacting with these spiritual beings ever since the day they were created it was no surprise they were supposed to be teaching us the ways of God until they realized we were going to replace them as the sons of God then they got really mad about that they got really mad about that but Watch what Jesus did, because they were supposed to be teaching us, which means they were supposed to be teaching us how to operate in all these things. Remember, we have the power of God inside of us. They were angels. They had power, but it was given to them. We have the source. Everywhere we go. I was thinking about that, actually. Um, I was, 
We were in Texas. I go a couple ways, but we were in Texas. And uh, in Texas, they have these really cool caves you can go to. And if you want to see me, Christian Johnson, come alive, bring me to anywhere with caves. I absolutely love them on our honeymoon, actually. They have some really good ones in Hawaii. And Lacey's like, we flew all the way to Hawaii to find out you could just play in a cave for a week. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Isn't it great? Well, we were in these caves in Texas, and they're big caves, like Batman-style big caves for the Bat Cave, okay? Um, and they're absolutely huge. Like, I, they're, they're breathtaking. Well, they do this thing where they'll put you in the cave, and you have your tour guide, and all the lights are on, and they're like, okay, we're going to shut all the lights off because it's complete darkness, like zero light. In fact, they actually won't do it too long because you'll start to hallucinate. I'm like, do it, do it, do it. I want to see this. <laughs> they want to do it. Um, but when that light went off, it was complete and utter darkness. I still had my light. Maybe I didn't see it in the natural because it was very dark. You couldn't even see your hand this far away. I've never been in darkness like it. But I was still able to pray in tongues. I was still able to call on the name of the Lord. Even if his soul was in Hades, Lord, will you deliver me? Will you save my soul? And he pulled him out. He pulled Jesus out. Everywhere we go, no matter how dark you think it is around you, you have that light on the inside of you. You have that power of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, everywhere you go. And everywhere I go, no matter how deep, and we were under the highway at that point. It was actually pretty good. I think we were like, what, 50, 80 feet down below the highway, something like that. So you were under everybody. They were all doing their thing, complete darkness. I still had my light. I can make a sermon out of anything. I love doing it. I still had my light no matter what. You know, and uh, we were, uh, I was diving with uh, Keith. We were up at, uh, in Maine uh, at Noble Lighthouse. And we were down, it's probably like 30, 40 feet, which really isn't that deep as far as diving goes. It's not that deep. And I'm just swimming along, and I'm just looking at God's creation. It's a whole new world when you're in the ocean. Whole new world. And I'm just praying in tongues gently through my regulator because even down there, when I can't breathe without air on my back, I can still pray in tongues because he's with me everywhere I go. There's nowhere I've ever been since the day I got born again. He doesn't go with me. There are places you may feel he's not near you. He's closer with you than ever. I was explaining that to somebody yesterday. I'm getting ready to, uh, to leave their house. And I said, it doesn't matter how close you feel to the Lord. It's how close you are to the Lord. Remember, if he's on the inside of you, he's already as close as he's ever going to be. You don't have to wait to get there what you can have on earth here. It's just whether or not you're going to push through all the natural distractions to get what you could have. I don't want to wait till I'm in heaven to get what I can experience now. So they were supposed to be teaching us the things of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Pastor Joe taught on that one last week. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Is the Holy Spirit your helper? Or is he just somebody that prays through you once in a while? I've seen people, they, you swear they don't know how to talk English. They pray in tongues so much, but realistically, sometimes they don't seem to have changed that much. Have they allowed him to be the helper he needs to be in their life? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the, whole, who the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you, or he dwells with you, and will be in you. I want God with me and in me. I want him everywhere. I want him all over me. I want him around me. I want him on the inside of me. I want him in my spirit. I want him in my brain. I want him in my body. I want him everywhere. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about how to have that happen in Philippians 4. Go over there real quick if you have your Bibles. If not, you don't have to go over there for the sake of time. Philippians chapter 4. I was just sharing with Frank. I'm like, you know what? iPads are so great. If any of you all ever preach, you ever try to find a book you're trying to find in the Bible for whatever reason, it's not where you want it to be. So then you're flipping around. That doesn't happen with an iPad. It's kind of great. Philippians chapter 4. Um, 
And we'll start in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. So right there is the peace of God. Let's keep reading. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. God in you, God with you. You do those two things, you got it. That's how Jesus was able to be so effective, because remember in John chapter 3, when he was talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee, he came to him by night, because he didn't want the other guys beating him up, he said, Lord, he said, Rabbi, how are you able to do these things, because no man can do these things unless God is with them. That's when Jesus said, surely I say to you, you have to be born again. Jesus was able to do those things because God is with him, because he was able to think on the things God wants him to think about. And we're focused on God things to think about. Our minds are completely renewed. Our minds are completely different. And our walks in our life are completely different. Because our mind, our thoughts lead to our imagination. You start thinking about God thoughts, you have God imagination. Well, your imagination leads to your lifestyle. You want a God lifestyle thought, start having God imaginations. And it starts with having God thoughts. You know, you're allowed to daydream with God. You ever daydream with your spouse? daydream of your spouse, you daydream of things you want to go do, things on vacation, things you want to go see while you're doing certain activities, things you want to go fly to, destinations, you daydream about those things, and if you think about it enough, you'll find a way to make it happen. You think about the things of God enough, you're going to find a way to make it happen. I'll give you a hint, it involves starving yourself and praying in tongues a lot. (laughs) It's called fasting. It's a sure way to make them happen in your life. Uh, you can go back to my slides. That's all where I'm going with that. <laughs> Thank you. The angels of God were supposed to be teaching us the ways of God. God cut out the middleman because the angels got jealous that we were going to replace them while well, we can't replace God. So God in his perfect mind said, I'm going to get rid of the angels. I'm going to put my spirit himself on the inside of them. So now when they learn it's not an angel teaching them, a third party, it's me, myself, my spirit teaching them the doctrines of God, not an angel anymore. So every time we pray, every time we read, it's God himself teaching us, not a third-party angel. And they're really cool guys, the ones that stuck around, the two-thirds that stayed. They pulled it off. They're doing pretty good right now. But we don't have to learn from them anymore. That's why when people say, oh, an angel showed up and taught me this whole religion, I doubt it because we got the Holy Spirit to teach us. Men are the mouthpiece. Now, an angel could say, hey, go talk to this person, go do this. He has a message for you. But we open our mouth, and we are able to receive the Holy Spirit himself. Every time we talk, every time we pray, we're able to have him everywhere we go. And living a life with the Holy Spirit looks a lot better than without. It's not always easy, but it's a lot better. And uh, go to Acts chapter 19. I'll give you guys a second. Because I was sanding all day yesterday and breathing in sawdust, and now my throat's dry. (laughs) So that's why I keep drinking water. But Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it, wow. (laughs) Okay, good job. And it happened while Paulus was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Paul didn't keep it simple when it came to things of the Spirit. He didn't keep it simple when it came to the Holy Spirit. And I've had people say, oh, we teach on the Holy Spirit here, or they teach on the Holy Spirit here, but they wait till you're in a small group for that. They don't do it on a Sunday morning. They don't want to weird people out. It's sickening. You're leaving out the third part of the equation of the Godhead. Can you imagine if we left out the third part of you? You're a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. You get one of, you're rid of one of those, you let me know how you turn out. Why would we get rid of the third person of the Godhead and completely get rid of the third equation? He said to them, did, uh, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him or who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. You can go back to my slides. And that's where I want to focus right now is the two things that happened after they received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. And don't get carried away, because one of the first things we need to have is have God-inspired speech coming from our spirit. That's what prophecy is. It's divinely inspired speech, and where people get it wrong, they think it's always foretelling. They think it's always telling of the future. That couldn't be part of it, but in the prophecy as a whole, you're talking things inspired by God himself. And honestly, you're surprised by the things that come out of your mouth when it happens. Because it's God literally talking through you. It's God himself, the spirit himself, saying things to the people, saying things to the congregation, saying things to your friends. And sometimes if you're not careful, he'll jump out and say something before you're able to stop it. What I mean by that is uh, it was uh, one time I was here working during the week, and uh, somebody had come in, and they were doing some stuff around, and uh, uh, they, had, they were going through some pain in their body. And you know, there are times you feel like you and God are best buds, and there is nothing separating you at all, and you are with him every step of the way, and then there's other times you just feel not that. <laughs> now remember, it's not what we feel, it's what we know. We know he's always with us. We know he doesn't leave us or forsake us. So it's never what you feel in the moment. It's what the word says. Once we go by feelings, we're going to get way off on either side of the ditch. And it's going to be a very bad day when we come to our senses. Back to the story. So I felt about as spiritual as a brick that day for whatever reason. And uh, this person, and out of nowhere, I'm like, can I pray for you? And I'm thinking inside, why did I say that? I don't want to pray for this person. <laughs> but I know the promises are yes and amen, regardless of how I feel. They were instantly touched by the Lord because I was able to be able to be a vessel for the Lord. So, but it's not just that. It's not just people in church. It's not just people in congregation. It's everywhere you go. It's your work. It's your marriage. It's your finances. It's everywhere you go. Everything you say, everything you do, you are able to speak the things of God and to see his result. And having the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is a huge part of that. It's a huge identity of that because without that, you're going to be very limited. You can learn a lot but the revelation, that comes from the Holy Spirit. That comes from hours of pacing the floor back and forth and back and forth and praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, building your faith in the Spirit. Did I put that? Uh, I put that twice, didn't I? And I want to talk about our brother right now, Stephen, Stephen, however you guys say it. I've heard it said both ways. Um, he was a man, and Stephen was doing his thing in the book of Acts. And if you remember right before this, in Acts chapter 6, the disciples were helping serve all the tables, and then they got busy, and people got mad because they didn't take care of everybody. They said, it's not good for us to do this as well. we got to focus on the word, and to be able to preach and speak this, we got to hire some other people who are full of the Holy Spirit who are able to serve the people while we're doing our thing. And I want to focus on him because when they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And I only put that one part because of the rest was all the other names. But notice what it says here. It says, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And Stephen full of, or Stephen full of faith and power. You have the Holy Spirit. You have faith. You have power. The three always go hand. You have faith, Holy Spirit. You have power. And watch what happens when he understood that. Being full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from one, what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. We're supposed to be able to talk about the things of the Lord with the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And people aren't able to resist it. They may not want to receive it, but they can't resist it. Because when you're saying things directly from the source of heaven, because remember, Jesus said in the book of John as well, he said, the things which he hears, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will say. 
What is the Holy Spirit hearing saying to you? The things of God saying about you, the things that Jesus is saying about you, the things that the three of them are talking about right now. Every time the Holy Spirit says something to you, through you, or about you, it came from the Father. That's what the Father thinks of us. He thinks of us so much, like I said, he got rid of the angel, he got rid of the middleman, and he put the Spirit to teach us. And the angels had the borrowed power, we have the source of the power. Praying in the Spirit builds your faith. Jude 20. Well, I thought faith came by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How does that work? How does does praying in tongues build your faith? Well, if we see over here and praying out the mysteries of God, praying out the mysteries of God is is what's going to build your faith. And what are the mysteries of God? We see that in the book of Corinthians. Uh, We'll go over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 6. You can go right over there, Sherry. That'd be great. And we're going to talk. This is where we're going to hang out for a couple minutes. This is what we're going to talk about, uh, what it's like to have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Because there's things about your life you may not know where to go in the Bible. You may not know what to read about. You may not know what to talk about. But you can always pray in the Spirit and have him pray through you so he can give you the things to read about, the things to talk about, and the things that you're supposed to know in that moment. Uh, Verse 6, please. Are you in Corinthians? Did I do it again? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So if they knew the secrets God was going to do, they wouldn't even kill Jesus. That's how much of a secret this was. Pastor Joe talked about that, that last week. They knew there was something special about mankind, but the fact that God would become one of his creation and not be above his creation, that's something nobody saw coming. And if they had known what was going to happen after the cross, they never would have killed him. Because what happened? Well, now rather than Jesus being one person on the earth, everyone who's born again is a Jesus on the earth, Jesus in them on the earth. So now, instead of one Jesus in this room, in the sanctuary, say there's 100 people, there's 100 people with the spirit of Jesus to go get the results that Jesus got, to go do the things that Jesus did, because he's on the inside of us. We're not God, but we have him in us. We have him through us, and we have him around us. Verse 9, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared, prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. He's able to reveal the mysteries of heaven to us. So the things that the fallen angels, the old sons of God right here, the principality and power, they weren't able to understand this because if they did, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. We're able to understand things about the Father. The devil himself wasn't able to understand, and he was walking in the midst of fire in the throne of heaven. He was covering it all. He heard it. I'm sure he learned some pretty good stuff, but we're able to understand things because of the Spirit in us he was never able to understand. Why would we want to get rid of a gift like praying in tongues? Because it's weird when it's the one thing we're able to receive so that we can understand the mysteries God has hidden about our lives. God's hidden about us. God's hidden about eternity. God's hidden about creation. We're able to know it by pressing into him. But are you going to press into him or are you going to have a good story? Man, that Brian and I was really great. I was excited and I shouted. What are you going to do with it after you leave? If your faith is built on excitement, your faith is going to falter once the excitement wears out. You see a lot of people, and you see in the parable of the sower, people get excited, they shoot up, they're full of faith, full of power, they're so excited, but there's no root, there's no foundation. Their faith isn't in the word, it's in the, it's in, in the experience. But once your faith is in the word, there's nothing that can shake it. There's nothing. Nothing that comes across your life can shake it when your faith is in the word. For what man knows, verse 11, for what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know these things. We're able to know everything that's going on in the Father's mind for us at that very moment when we press in and pray to him. 
That was the gift he gave us. That's the difference between having the Holy Spirit upon you and having the Holy Spirit within you. Because when you're praying, specifically when you're praying in tongues, you're pacing back and forth. You're going back and forth for hours, for days, for weeks, until one day you hit that gusher. You get the revelation you've been needing, and that was written on your heart, and they can put a gun to your head, and you're not going to change your mind because it's ingrained in the very DNA of who you are, and nothing is going to change your mind. That's how you're able, that's how you're supposed to be growing in the word. That's how you're supposed to be hearing the word. That's how you're supposed to be having your prayer time. There's four different functions of praying in tongues. But one of the biggest ones, I won't, I don't want to say it like that, but one of the ones we do the most is personal edification. You're just praying to yourself as you're reading the Bible, as you're driving your car, as you're going to work, as you're at work, as you're at church, or as, as, as you're at home. You're praying out the mysteries of God that he wants you to know. So sooner or later, you pray enough, and Jesus says, hey, you want to know what you've been praying out? How do you think Paul wrote all the New Testament? What do you think he was doing? He was walking all that time. He's praying in tongues. He said, I think my God, I pray more in tongues more than you all. So while he's doing that, he's praying, he's praying, he's praying, he's praying, he's walking. Angel shows up, Jesus shows up. Hey, you know all the things you've been praying? Here it is. And he's able to write two-thirds of the New Testament because he prayed in tongues more than anybody. But it wasn't Paul's gift. It's the church's gift. It's the bride's gift. So if Paul could do it, now our words are not going to be God written the way the Bible is, but they can be inspired by him to impact the lives that we're in. Amen? Amen. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Those are the mysteries that we're praying out. Those are the things. That's the impact of the life we're supposed to have. Adam and Eve had it, and they lost it all. It was gone. They ate the fruit. They fell. They lied. They lost it all. They lost the light. Jesus rose again from the dead. He stepped out of that grave, and he put his spirit on the inside of us. So everywhere we go, we have the light, and we have his spirit praying through us. Go back to the slides, but I believe that was the last one. So that's the life I want to live. Me too. There's some of you. That's the life I want to live. Me. That no matter where I go, no matter what I do, no matter how deep in the ocean I am, no matter how deep in water I am, I'm actually diving tonight for a night dive. That'll be fun. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, no matter how deep I am in those things, the Holy Spirit's with me everywhere I go. His power, the power of the Godhead. Well, I don't feel it. Well, you just pray. Glenn has a good saying. Uh, when, you've, when you feel like not shouting the most is when you have to shout the most. How do you say it, Glenn? Pray, pray, hardest, hardest. pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. Pastor Dave Roberson, Pastor Joe's spiritual father, used to talk about that. He would call it uh, spiritual plateaus. And you'd be praying, you'd be growing, and your spiritual walk, you're climbing, you're climbing, you're climbing, things are going great, and then you just flatline out of nowhere. Anybody ever been there? Now your flatline's like, God, where are you? We were doing great. Did you leave the car? Because I'm here. I don't feel you. What's going on? He called them spiritual plateaus, and he taught us that right at the other end of those is where your big gift is. That's where your big revelation is. That's where the next big thing the Lord wants you to do, but we got to keep pushing through that. No matter what life throws at us, no matter what life gives us, you push through those plateaus with the praying and the spirit. Pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. You push through that, and you're going to be jumping and shouting for joy because Jesus is going to give you what you've been going after because, as I said before, his promises are yes and amen in him. Amen. Well, amen.